Hi there, I'm JP Dice, and welcome in to Beyond the Briefing. This is our uh, YouTube channel where we talk about aviation and meteorology, uh, two things that uh, I absolutely love. I'm a longtime meteorologist and airline transport pilot, flight instructor, so we kind of marry all of those things together. And hopefully this channel helps you out and uh, figure out uh, how to fly safer in some of the weather that we have to deal with. That's one thing that is always constant, and that is change when it comes to uh, meteorology. Something that I am really excited about is uh, ForeFlight added this uh, a few months back, and I think it's a great feature. How many times have you been planning a trip and you're wondering, well, when do I break out on top of the clouds? Now, I, I've shown you some tricks and tips on how to figure this out through skew t diagrams and so forth, but ForeFlight is actually doing that for you. Uh, they're calculating that with some of the behind-the-scenes uh, data that we look at, but they're actually making it in a very easy-to-understand kind of way. So let's get right to it, show you what's going on. There I am in the little box. So we're in our standard ForeFlight page here, and I'm going to set this up for uh, the proper uh, direction of flight. And uh, heading uh, to McGee-Tyson Airport in Knoxville, Tennessee from Birmingham. I'm based in Birmingham. And this is a flight for 1130 in the morning, our little fictional flight that we're planning. One of the things that I really love is this profile view. Now, the profile view has been around for a while, uh, generally for terrain and obstacle clearance, that kind of thing. But now uh, they have an icing layer, they have a turbulence layer, and they have a cloud layer. And look at this. Based on what we're seeing here in this profile view, uh, we would get above the cloud cover at around 7,000 feet. So on this particular trip, if you wanted to stay out of the clouds and uh, maintain uh, VMC conditions, uh, go ahead and climb up to, say, 9,000 feet, and you would be in good shape there. You've got your terrain clearances, and you would be above the clouds. Now, it's very important this time of the year to stay out of the clouds, even if you're on an IFR flight plan. Why is that? Because of the icing potential in the clouds. Visible moisture, right? Uh, and if you don't have ice protection, uh, it's a bad place to be lingering. Uh, with uh, many cases, that freezing level is coming down on you. So uh, staying out of the clouds is not a bad thing. Plus your passengers, they may actually like to see outside other than what appears to be looking on the inside of a golf ball. Uh, not exactly the most uh, enjoyable trip when you stay in the clouds the entire time. So uh, this is a great little tool to figure out when you're going to break out. Uh, you can see on the tab there, we have airspace, icing. I'll go click on the icing tab. And it is not bringing any icing up, which is good news. Turbulence, it does have uh, some turbulence there, low level, and that's over uh, the mountains. Not a big surprise there. You get some turbulence as those little eddies uh, form over the uh, mountains due to the uh, wind flow. So we go back to just the uh, cloud cover. And you can see kind of when you would break out and when you're going to break uh, back into the cloud cover based on this tool. Great tool. You can use it in, in real time, what's happening right now, or you can use it as a forecast tool and show you what the cloud cover is going to be uh, the next day and where the tops are going to be. Now, keep in mind, it's a forecast tool. And I can't stress this enough. You know, working in TV weather for a long time, um, I've had to preach this a lot. Anytime you're forecasting, you're predicting into the future. What happens when you predict into the future? Sometimes it's not exactly the way you predict. So uh, we're using some great data. ForeFlight's using some fantastic data. Uh, but sometimes the forecast doesn't work out. But use this for planning purposes. It says you break out at 7,000 feet. It might be, you know, uh, tomorrow it might be 9,000 feet. But more or less, this is going to be pretty close. And it's going to be a great uh, tool to help you plan ahead. I want to show you something else. We're going to go over to uh, the other computer here, and this is something, boom, punch it up. Uh, this particular week is very active weather week, and uh, I'm actually recording this between Christmas and New Year's, and we've got a dynamic system that's coming in. I'm looking at the GFS model, uh, available at many sources. I like to use Pivotal Weather, pretty uh, user-friendly site. GFS model is is the global forecast system. It's the medium range or it's the longer range model. 
Uh, it comes from the old MRF, the medium range forecast model, but it's called the Global Forecast System. And it's what TV stations uh, and uh, even your weather apps uh, help use to uh, do a seven day forecast or a 10 day forecast, whatever uh, they may be doing. It's, it's a handy tool. Uh, it's not as high res as like your NAM or three kilometer NAM or the HRRR, but it is a good tool to help you know what's going to happen in the longer range. Recently, we had this big bout of colder temperatures, this particular model, as well as the Euro, which we use in conjunction with this one to help us with this longer range forecast, did a great job on those uh, predictions. But I want to show you something here. Uh, let's say you were planning a flight. Uh, and this is going to be uh, for Thursday evening. So you can see Zulu time. That's going to be Friday at uh, 0 Z. So we're going to be talking about 6 p.m. This is going to be Thursday. This is, uh, in this particular case, this is going to be New Year's Eve. And it shows quite a bit of precipitation there uh, across Alabama, where we are, where I record uh, beyond the uh, briefing. Let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to take this up uh, full screen. And you'll see exactly what we're talking about here. So I'm going to just click in here uh, around where my airplane's based. And this is going to be Jefferson County, uh, Alabama. Let's bring up a SKU T chart. And what we're seeing here at this particular case, there is very little uh, instability. There's a whole lot of wind shear at that point. Uh, so during the evening, it's mainly, it looks like it's going to be more or less rain. But we can back this up one time period and take a look over uh, maybe toward the west and southwest. I'll just click uh, around Tuscaloosa County there. And marginal tornado risk is what that's telling me uh, on this particular skew T, and that's based on our, our CAPE, our convectively available potential energy, is, uh, is going to uh, be right there around 552, and our shear is 27. So you put that together and there is a little bit of a severe weather threat in there. So we're looking at the GFS model and this would be a good application. Say for instance, if you were planning a flight on Thursday and today is Sunday and you're thinking, well, my goodness, we've got a, a potential there for some severe weather as we uh, get into the afternoon hours. And that skew T chart, and I'll go back over here. I'll just take this back full screen so you guys don't have to stare at the back of my uh, head. Look at this. You see the winds? That's what we call wind shear. And I know a lot of times you're thinking wind shear and uh, in relation to aircraft and you're thinking about Delta Flight 191 and so forth. That, that's the type of wind shear. But what we're looking at here is a larger scale atmospheric wind shear. It's out of the south at the surface, but as you go up higher in the atmosphere, say up to, to 9,000 feet, that wind becomes uh, more southwesterly. So we're seeing a twisting of the wind. It almost goes from the southeast to the southwest as you go from the surface up to around 9,000 feet or so based on the millibars there. So we have the wind shear and we have some insta instability. What I will tell you, something that's uh, pretty interesting to know uh, during the winter season, uh, typically to get severe weather, you don't have to have a lot of instability. Uh, we have what we call high shear and low instability type severe weather events. Very common, and that's because our jet stream, our upper level wind pattern, is so much more active during the winter season, late fall, winter, and even uh, going into the early spring. In, in my history, at least here in the southeast, over the last number of years, I've actually had more severe weather events that have happened during the winter months. I know during the winter, we, we talk so much about icing potential and low overcast and those sort of things, but we do have a fair amount of severe weather that happens during the cool season, so just keep that in mind. What we're looking at again there, that is off the GFS model, this is a sounding, it is a virtual sounding. It's a sounding that's created from a forecast model. These forecast models, predictions into the future, they do a pretty good job. They're not always the gospel. There, there, there can be some variations. And again, as we get the, the higher resolution model data, let's say again, we go back to our example. We're planning our trip on Thursday and it's Sunday night. We've got the GFS that we can look at. 
Later on tonight, certainly tomorrow, we can start looking at the mesoscale models, which are going to have a better handle on where those severe storms are going to set up. This gives you more of a broader view. As you get in within about three or four days, you start being able to really narrow things down a lot better in terms of timing and also the magnitude of the threat. So you can do that with those higher res models and within you know, 24 to 36 hours, you can really pin it down a lot more to help you figure out, okay, I can leave in the morning versus the afternoon. I'll leave in the morning, it's gonna be okay. Wait until the afternoon and we start uh, resulting in a lot more active weather. And I know when you actually go on the trip, before you go, you check the current conditions, you check the briefing, and you look at all the standard pilot stuff. But these are great tools to help you ahead of the game if you've got a trip on the schedule or you're trying to leave and, and do something on a given day. It helps you make that decision, okay, I'm going to leave on a Friday instead of a Thursday. Or if I'm leaving Thursday, I'm going to leave Thursday morning as opposed to the afternoon. So it really helps in what we call those no-go and go decisions. Uh, great tools out there. We have more information than we ever had before. And by the way, if you're interested in more skew T type interpretations, we've got some other videos out on that in this uh, Beyond the Briefing series. So a few things I wanted to touch on. We'll go back to our foreflight and a few other things. Let's go over here to, I, I selected the airport tab and let's see if I can get rid of me. Notice something else is here. We actually have a daily forecast. This is for the Shelby County Airport in um, Shelby County, Alabama, one of the airports that I also fly out of. And you can see a daily forecast, very much like uh, what you have on the, the TV weather apps, whether it be your local TV station, weather channel, whatever it may be. And it's got high and low temperatures and sunset and sunrise and basically the sky condition. Bear in mind, uh, this is when it goes out past a number of days as you get into next week. This is going to be uh, generally looking at just some raw model data there and giving you an idea. Uh, as you look out, you know, tomorrow or the next day, it's pretty good. But again, forecast model data, I mean, think about it, a 9% chance of rain. Obviously, they're querying a computer. We humans don't say, hey, it's going to be a 9% chance of rain tomorrow, right? How many times have you ever watched <laughs> a weather cast and they've got a 7% chance of rain? Look at Thursday. It's a 77% chance of rain. That's, uh, that's computer data. That's uh, just raw. Uh, but again, it's helpful. It's uh, good with your planning. I'm glad they stuck that on there. We didn't have that before. So it gives you an idea past the, the TAF or the MOSS. So you have more good information. And let's just review. METAR, that's happening now. The TAF is in the future. The TAF is human hands. Your local National Weather Service office has put that together. You've got meteorologists that actually make that TAF. The MOSS, that is raw model data. That is just uh, gridded model data. It just gives you um, what the model thinks. Uh, there's a lot of room for error in the MOSS. It goes out uh, in a longer period of time, but again, want to stress the MOS data. I wouldn't make my flights uh, based on the MOS data. The TAFs are a lot better. And uh, of course, um, once you get kind of good with the uh, forecasting and looking at uh, things like the HRRR and the NAM and things like that, that's really going to help you in all of your flight planning. I mean, I'm just amazed at all the tools that we have now. And it doesn't stop once you get in the airplane. You need to constantly be looking at this on your uh, cockpit systems, whether you have Avidyne or Garmin or your, your four flight with a Stratus box, however you get that information, constantly be looking at it because weather's always changing. And remember, you're in a vehicle that is moving through the atmosphere at a pretty good rate of speed, some faster than others. So you're going to be uh, transversing changing conditions out there. This is a very active time of the year to be flying, so make sure you stay on top of it. Freezing levels are a lot lower uh, this time of the year, so even those days where would typically be a harmless IFR day can be problematic if you're flying an airplane like I own, a, a Mooney M20J, no icing protection. We stay out of that. Or even if you have a, an airplane with ice protection, 
that's not foolproof. Uh, the TKS systems, remember that's a finite amount of fluid there. So finite means it can come to an end. And you know, there are times when even the uh, de-ice boots uh, can be overwhelmed if you're in a severe icing type situation. So lots of information here I've thrown at you in this uh, edition of Beyond the Briefing. Love talking to you guys. Hopefully this is helping you uh, fly a little bit safer out there because the point is I just get tired of seeing those NTSB reports where people are venturing out, doing things that they shouldn't be doing, and we have all this weather information where they could clearly make that decision on whether or not to go. So until next time, you guys fly safe, and always I love hearing from you. I'll be looking for you in the uh, comments section, and if you like these videos, uh, click the, uh, the subscribe there, and uh, also share it with others. We'll see you later. I'm JP Dice, this edition of Beyond the Briefing.